Well, Shalom and welcome to everyone. Uh, we, we welcome everyone watching all over the world. Uh, today is a very special program for you, a, a wonderful discussion. As always, of course, uh, we have Baruch all the way from Israel. Welcome, Baruch. How are you? Shalom. Shalom. I'm doing well, thank God. Wonderful, wonderful. And we also extend a very warm welcome to Pastor Marco from uh, Devore Truth in San Bernardino, California, USA. Welcome. Uh, shalom. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, wonderful to be with you, and uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, I'm glad I'm here, and uh, I'm excited about today's uh, today's episode. Wonderful. We're going to kick it off right away. This is uh, an important prophecy update. Um, but just before we do, I just want to go by way of introduction. Uh, Pastor Marco, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm subscribed to your YouTube channel. I know you've got a wonderful uh, church there in uh, San Bernardino in California. And if you could just take a couple of minutes just to tell us about that, that'll be great for all the viewers. Yeah. Well, thank you, Christian, for subscribing. And after you subscribe and watch our videos, you still invited me. So that's a blessing. Um, <laughs> you never know sometimes. So I appreciate you guys. And uh, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been pastoring Community Church to Devore for uh, just over 16 years now. Uh, over 16 years, we've been in uh, the San Bernardino area. Uh, I actually uh, grew up in Southern California. So th this is sort of the area uh, I grew up in, sort of closer to L.A., uh, which is kind of suburb of LA if you think about it in, in, in a larger perspective. But I was actually born in Nicaragua, uh, Central America. So lived under communist, um, a communist regime and uh, one of the most poorest countries in the Western hemisphere. I think it's the second one um, be right below Haiti. Uh, so we lived in some difficult times as a family. Um, God's hand was with us and he brought us to the States uh, sh shortly after the revolution and uh, communist takeover. Um, sometime around uh, 1995, 1996, uh, uh, Jesus revealed himself to me through the gospel and believe in faith and repentance changed my life. And ever since then, I've been wanting to draw closer to him, teach people God's word. And uh, uh, it, it's been his grace. And uh, surely uh, going this far and looking back at it, uh, surely has been God's mercy and grace upon us to let us teach his word, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus and uh, the ministry has grown, not only locally, as we spread the gospel locally in San Bernardino, uh, but as well as uh, by virtue of technologies, sort of, sort of like we have today. It has grown into um, uh, video teachings and teaching people online. And that's been a wonderful experience, too. And uh, I get a chance to uh, speak with you guys. I also work very close with Memorial Ministries, which is a mission organization, gospel preaching and teaching the word of God as well. So that's been a wonderful experience as well. So um, it's all been God's grace, really, from, from the very beginning. Undeserved. Uh, and yet he, make, he makes sinners like us to be saints. And so thank you for Christ. thank you for. Praise God. And look, uh, for everyone watching, I, I certainly encourage you, first of all, if you live in the California area, uh, I think it, it's uh, northeast from L.A., isn't it? If yes, I remember, uh, 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 right. uh, off Route 66. Uh, yeah, it's actually we're really close to the old Route 66. Yeah, yep. uh, the yep. famous, famous Route 66. Uh, literally, we're off the 15 freeway. So people uh, 15 north. So people head out to uh, um, either toward Vegas or Nevada. We're on that route. Uh, just east of Los Angeles, and yep. uh, since you're heading north, and um, I always tell people we're between LA and Palm Springs. That's really the the best way to right, put it. Right. You know, we're about an hour from Palm Springs and an hour from Los Angeles, so uh, that's pretty much in the middle. Wonderful, beautiful congregation there, and and uh, for those watching, please, um, if you're looking for a church, it's a wonderful church to be a part of. Uh, there's certainly no compromising in uh, in that church. They they're preaching God's word. And uh, also uh, on YouTube, please subscribe to that YouTube channel. Wonderful teachings. And I also enjoy your catching up with Jacob updates regularly. Uh, love them. Those are a lot of fun. Those are a lot of fun. We, yeah. we, get a, we get a chance to talk about a variety of subjects and, uh, you know, from technology to, um, you know, what's going on with uh, cryptocurrency to uh, digital, digital currency, which is a big topic. Uh, persecution of the church was going on in Israel. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Jacob's a lot of fun to, to talk to. Yep. He does a wealth of knowledge in a lot of different areas. Uh, I, I get to watch and ask him questions. And so it's a lot of fun to learn. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's uh, crack on with today's program, which uh, is a prophetic update. But uh, we're going to be focusing on two things today. Um, prophetically, the increase of knowledge, as stated by Daniel, and Christian persecution. So we're going to start looking at what he foretold in terms of the increase of knowledge and travel. So I'm just going to start sharing the screen here. 
Okay, so the first scripture we're going to look at here is Daniel 12, verse 4, where uh, the Lord tells us, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Baruch, over to you for your opening comments on this prophetic end times scripture. First, when it says seal up the book, we know later on in that same chapter that that is an expression which means these, these prophecies are not primarily for Daniel's time, but rather for a later time. And I believe we're approaching rapidly the time that, that Daniel's book is for. That means it's going to be unrevealed, unsealed, so that we can grasp with understanding his, his revelation. But it's so important where it says at the end, knowledge shall increase. In, in modern Hebrew, there's really another word that, that needs to be brought out, and that's word information. Right. In Hebrew, we use the word informatia. There's also another Hebrew word, meida, but the point is that it may not be speaking about just knowledge, but more and more information going out, and that increase could bring about confusion. And I think that's one of the, the strategies of the enemy the, the devil is to confuse people away from the truth. It doesn't say that there's going to be an increase of acceptance of the truth or an agreement with the truth, just an increase of knowledge. And, and I like what you said also, where, where it says running to and fro, we're talking about an increase of movement, or as you said, travel. And, and we certainly have seen that up until the corona times. And the increase of travel usually is a good thing for economies. It oftentimes signifies an increase of business activity. Yeah. And now with the corona time and that's being being so limited, we we are going to see greater economic hardship. I know in the country that I reside in Israel, the lack of travel is really taking a toll on the Israeli economy. So this could be speaking about those things and that we need to be sensitive for the times we're living in and how prophecy is is coming into the focus for individuals in able banking them able to discern what's going on and what god's up to and what the enemy's up to amen thank you we're going to look at um a couple of things here these uh this is from the atag the air transport action group you can see on the slide there how from 1950 um, until 2018, travel, international tourism, Australia arrivals in the world have increased. Just that figure alone at 4.5 billion people in 2019 were carried by the world's airlines. I mean, that is a staggering, staggering increase just from 1950 which was well under, I mean, well under the probably 50 million looking at this scale. Pastor Michael, what, what are your thoughts in something like this when you see prophecy unfolding before our very eyes in terms of what Daniel spoke about the increase in travel? You know, when we look at Daniel, and it is fascinating to me because this is one of the reasons I, I became a Christian. Uh, I, was, uh, I was an agnostic uh, for quite years as my uh, teenage years heading up to university. And um, I, I did not believe the scriptures. Uh, I was raised Roman Catholic, but I had uh, uh, basically turned against all religion, didn't believe God can be known uh, personally. And so as an agnostic, I rejected all forms of all sorts of religion, all forms of it. Um, and, and, you know, from Roman Catholicism to Judaism to anything. Um, what captivated me is the scriptures. When I began to read the scriptures, they were not like Nostradamus or there were not things that were nebulous and things that people can make up. Uh, they were direct. They were time specific. They were specifically dealing with things of the end. And there was no doubt to me, especially the book of Daniel convinced me that this book was uh, from a, a different dimension, as I would call it back then. It, it had divine origins. And I know now from, from reading the scriptures and knowing Christ and knowing the Messiah that, uh, of course, God was speaking to us about the future time. Unbelievable. Daniel speaks of a, a situation here in chapter 12, which is no doubt that knowledge will increase. We're looking at exponential growth of knowledge. It is, it's doubling every few years. It used to take uh, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, hundreds of years, you know, from, you know, from Moses to, um, 
to to our founding fathers of this country in America. You know, it didn't increase. It didn't increase that much. Knowledge did not increase that much. Yeah. But yeah. we take it from the founding fathers till now. Uh, you realize uh, it, it is explosive. It is exploding, and we do live in an information age. We had the agricultural age. We have the industrial revolution. No doubt, this century has been. Uh, last two centuries and been information age. It is doubling and it is continue to double and it's exponential to uh, to know what we're gonna to know now and to realize what we know today. In a few years, it will be uh, obsolete. It, yeah. That's true of science. That's true of technology. That's true of medicine. That's true of travel. Uh, that's true in a lot of areas. And so, knowledge will increase. Absolutely true. Daniel was absolutely 100% uh, um, accurate on this, and you've seen it, and, and this is part of Daniel 12, and in the context of it in chapter 11 and chapter 12, uh, as, as Dr. Baruch has pointed out in his own studies, that it, it, does, it does deal with the end. This is the end time. This is yeah. the, the word that Daniel uses, a time of the end, and it's, of course, chapter 11. There's no chapter division between 11 and 12. Mm -hmm. uh, it, what's speaking of the Antichrist and his campaign against Israel in the last days, and then chapter 12 deals with the resurrection. And um, as Daniel is writing this, and he's instructed to seal up the book, mm -hmm. uh, there is an instruction there that uh, he's to seal this until the time of the end. So to me, as I understand Daniel um, now, uh, I understand Daniel more now than I did 15 years ago, 20 right. years ago. Right. Why? Things have become, have become more relevant, have become more uh, open to us. Uh, which I think has to do, and uh, um, I don't know if you want to keep talking about the, the, the growth in technology and information. Yeah, no, I've got some other slides, but there's excellent points. I mean, when yeah. we look at travel, <clears throat> this is just a simulation of an air traffic over the USA in one day. Incredible. All those little dots that people are seeing on that screen represent an airplane. So a 24-hour lapse, of course, but the amount of air traffic in one day in the USA is just phenomenal. Yeah. When we, uh, we look at, these are the satellites apparently around Earth. All those little red dots, they're actual satellites at the moment that are hovering around this planet. You can take information <laughs> today and put it in a little microchip, what it used to take uh, buildings to yep. store information in. It yep. is unbelievable. If I were to try to talk to my grandfather or my grandmother about this, it will be hard for them to understand it. They, they would not be able to understand the capacity of a, of a, of a phone, of a smartphone, it has the same capabilities of a whole room of computers back in the 70s. And that was just the 70s. That's right. That's that right. Was, yeah. So um, it, it is unreal what has been unleashed in the world is technology and information. Yeah. Uh, people can know more about subjects today than any other time in history. Um, unfortunately, and, and this may be a side point, uh, we're, not, we're not much wiser. We might know a lot, we might be able to have capabilities of knowing, but we certainly are not, uh, it's, it's not a better humanity, it's not a better society. It has not brought forth the, um, uh, the utopia that many um, governments or uh, to companies have promised. It, it really has not, it actually has brought more actually depression and desolation and isolation. Absolutely. And uh, you touched on this earlier. This is uh, an article released in August last, in 2019. Uh, it's interesting. The title of the, the article is Today's Technology Foretold in Bible Prophecy. And it just uh, basically says, for those who can't see it, as for the knowledge increasing, an item at the Digital Journal website noted this staggering trend until year, the year 1900, Human knowledge approximately doubled every century. However, by 1950, human knowledge doubled every 25 years. In the year 2000, human knowledge would double every year. And now our knowledge is almost doubling every day. Baruch, what are your comments? I mean, when we look at, once again, that scripture alone in Daniel, specifically talking about the increase of knowledge, like I, I asked Pastor Marco, are we seeing prophecy unfold before our very eyes? Well, I appreciate it. What Marco sh shared, yes, we are seeing prophecy unfolded before our eyes. And all of this should cause us to think in one way, and that is be prepared. Yeah. 
the things that that God has said, and this is just one example, and we could look at many, many other prophetic things that are are taking place. Sure. But but yeah. God's word is accurate, and therefore we are moving rapidly. I like the the word that you use, Christian, where, where there's a convergence of things pushing closer and closer to bringing about the last days. We're moving towards that. We're moving rapidly. Prophecy is being unfolded before our eyes, and we need to be ready for what the, the apostles, what, what the prophets have told us is going to be. And, and by and large, in the vast majority of, of Christianity, certainly this is true in Judaism, in, in Israel where I live, there is a, a hesitancy, there is ignoring a prophecy and this is is really really going to cause the people to be unprepared and when you're unprepared you'll become desperate and when you're desperate you'll be easily deceived yeah. so this hopefully will encourage people to to know what these prophecies are amen the um as we know the enemy satan will always try and use technology for evil things whether it be by a way of uh, artificial intelligence or just simply just um, using certain individuals for his own agenda. This is an interesting article here. It's, it's not something new, but inside the first church of artificial intelligence. So apparently this uh, fellow here on the screen, uh, his name was Anthony Lewandowski. His church, he, he called it his first AI religion, the way of the future. Um, where he's basically, you know, creating artificial intelligence as his God. I did hear that recently, though, his uh, church was shut down. Praise God for that. But yeah. we can see here that with an increasing knowledge as well, that we're looking at, you know, we have to be so cautious, so very cautious about deception, because the enemy will use that to his advantage. Over to both of you, just for your comments in terms of what we see here on the screen now. Rook, would you like to comment on that, or do you? you I, I was to... I was going to hear what you said and just agree with you at the end. So why don't you go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no doubt. I, I've been following Lewandowski for quite some time. He is a, a, an interesting character, nonetheless. Uh, he's from Silicon Valley. He's from here in California, and um, he's basically has made technology uh, their god. Uh, artificial intelligence is their god. Um, technology is uh, basically the, the idol which they worship. And uh, they, they've gone so far into believing that technology will be the savior of humanity. And this is where, again, back to Daniel's prophecy, it, it, this is for the end. There was no way this could be fulfilled uh, any other time in history because we've never had this surge of knowledge and information uh, in, in world history. So, I mean, if we're living at, in this time and people that are alive in this time, not only is it a great privilege to know these things, it might scare some people to a certain degree, but, but it's really an amazing thing to be alive at this time in history that God would have uh, would allowed us to live at this time, the, the, as the Bible calls it, the end of the age, because we would see things that uh, no other prophet had seen in the past, no other, the apostles didn't see this, and it's quite quite amazing. Uh, robotics, artificial intelligence. Uh, there is a fellow in uh, MIT, Max Turkman, I believe is his name, uh, who would follow up on Lewandowski and his ideas of, uh, uh, you know, what if artificial intelligence was a uh, in charge of this world? And he actually creates, and I think it's a the book is called Human 3.0, Humanity 3.0, in yep. which he actually yep. um, uh, deals with the scenarios. What if we had a benevolent artificial intelligence dictator who would actually rule the world? And uh, he gives three or four scenarios where one is a benevolent dictator. One is a uh, sort of a mix of both benevolent and, uh, and, and, and a harsh dictator, authoritarian. And it says our worst case scenarios is this artificial intelligence will grow and actually outgrow our, our thinking, would create a world where humans are obsolete, he says, and we would have somebody that would be um, in charge of the world that it's... Uh, not benevolent and actually sees humanity as a uh, as a roadblock to to their um, ultimate goal. Now, of course, this is uh, in his perspective in scientific uh, science, science fiction, I should say. Uh, but you could see the scenario in which he paints. So is Lewandowski. 
artificial intelligence will rule that we have to keep up with artificial intelligence. In fact, uh, a very famous uh, um, businessman, Elon Musk, uh, mm. actually con concedes that the humanity is not going to be able to keep up with artificial intelligence. And so therefore, we must join artificial intelligence. We must join uh, robotics and actually uh, merge with them uh, as one through his yeah. Neuralink, his, his chip on, 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 on- Yeah, that's the Neuralink, isn't it? When he wants to- Yeah, that's the Neuralink, yeah. That we right. must mm. sync, you know, syncretize with it. And therefore, so we will not be obsolete, that we actually have to conform to AI and the way it's growing and the way it's growing exponentially. Says so there's no way humanity can keep up with the technology and the advancements of it and knowledge that humanity, instead of being obsolete, we will just merge with machine, he says. And that would create this benevolent, and they, again, they go back to this idea, an artificial intelligence that would actually rule the world through algorithms yeah. and technology. And, the, and we would not be obsolete because we would have to join, uh, we would have to join artificial intelligence via uh, chips, via microchips. Yeah, very, very dangerous. Baruch, what, what are your thoughts when you look at something like this in terms of, um, I mean, there's so many scriptures that we can look at in terms of end times, and we will be looking at quite a few later on, but we've discussed this before, Baruch, that we know that the mark of the beast, unlike what people, some people, uh, you know, are, are worried about that it could be the vaccine or it could uh, be other things that you and I have discussed this, that we, we know that it will be something that we, we know that people will deliberately know and take that mark. However, with the increase in technology and artificial intelligence, how do you see this unfolding in terms of uh, the enemy and the Antichrist system putting this together in place for a not-so-distant future? <clears throat> a very important word scripturally is freedom and liberty. And that freedom and liberty is so that we can obey God. We are set free from the bondage of sin so that we can agree with God, serve God, worship God. And, and what I see here, and this is true, and there's a gentleman in, in Germany that, that is leading an economic forum, mm. and he Klaus. talks a great deal uh, yeah. with, with, excuse me? Klaus, I believe he's his Yes, ex exactly. Thank you. That's exactly who I was referring to about how artificial intelligence is going to be necessary. It's going to be utilized more and more in society. And it may become that much work is going to become obsolete by human beings. And therefore, this is going to pave the way for, and I'll, I'll turn to Marco for a second. I, if, correct me if this is not the case, but I, I saw that in California that they had passed some legislation for a, a stipend, a guaranteed income of Five hundred or a thousand dollars a month for individuals, regardless of of anything that they have have a right to that. Is that correct? Uh, correct, Brooke. You just passed uh, a couple of days ago. Five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars, and uh, is basically universal basic income coming through. A couple of cities have passed it. I think uh, uh, prior to this, uh, Bakersfield and other areas up the up the um, Northern California, but now is a state it's statewide. You're absolutely right. Well, this is what this gentleman class is saying is that that this we're going to become more and more obsolete for many, many things. Mm -hmm. There will be a few people that will be needed, but but by and large, we're going to have much more leisure and things are going to go cashless. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you're going to receive your finances, whether it's from an independent company or what, it's going to be a government clearinghouse that is going to transfer digital currency into someone's account, well, this, this would really bring about control, easy to control people if the government decides who gets money and who does not, who's compliant and who's not. So this is all going to lead to a, a lessening of freedom and liberty and individual choice and decisions upon humanity. But, but there's also, and I would like to caution against this, and, and certainly Marco did not, not say this or, or Christian, but, but others are saying that there's going to be a, a, almost a blurring between artificial intelligence and, and the leadership of that and the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Although I, don't, I won't be surprised if artificial intelligence is used 
uh, by the enemy. But I still want to emphasize that, that there's a demonic aspect. There's a supernatural one of the dangers is, is that more and more Christians are, are buying into a, a natural explanation for, for the things in the Bible. What we see in the last days, well, it's nuclear weapons, it's this, it's going to be the outcome of war through artificial intelligence soldiers and such. I would want to pull back. I believe that artificial intelligence will be used, but there's still going to be demonic influence. There is going to be creatures, demonic creatures that is going that are going to manifest that that the Antichrist is going to be a human being that is a type of Satan incarnate that is going to rule. And there's that demonic aspect, that spiritual dimension that is of evil. And will they blend with artificial intelligence that it will be utilized? But we don't want to move away from everything's human, everything's natural, and, and move away from the fact that there is a spiritual dimension that, that the Bible says is going to take control of this world for a period of time before Messiah comes and judges that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we're just going to share a very short clip. Um, and, and one of them, like I said, Pastor Marco, is one that you put on your website. So I've stolen that from you. But um, it, it really emphasizes where we are at prophetically in terms of technology because some people still can't grasp the fact that there's such a convergence even in technology and travel and so forth but we're going to show a very short clip and then we'll be right back with some comments this dubai nail salon has taken nail polish from basic to high tech why bother typing your contact information into another person's phone when they can get the information from a microchip on your fingernail? That's what clients at Lenore Beauty Lounge are doing. Owner Norm McCarum explains the kind of information that can be held in a glossy set of nails. This chip now it's working as a business card. So she can download her website, her social media accounts, her uh, name, her contacts. So she will choose and we install it by NFC uh, application. The microchip service starts with a traditional gel manicure. Nails are filed into shape and given a coat of polish. Once the client decides what information they want the chip to provide, it is glued onto the nail and covered in another layer of gel polish. Then the scanning can begin. I'm really excited now that I've had it installed. Um, now, if I'm in a loud place and I want to share my Instagram or my social media, I'll say, scan my finger. <laughs> the microchip manicure idea came from the restrictions of the COVID-19 pandemic. If social distancing and paperless services are encouraged, what options could people use besides exchanging business cards? I was thinking why uh, I cannot do something different from my beauty salon something that we can do it uh, by our beauty services. So uh, we came up with this idea and it's really doing well. The microchips can be used with both Android and iOS software and can be updated with whatever information the user chooses to share. But is microchipping fingernails a trend we'll be seeing on manicures across the world? So it's the, the fun and the joys of trying something new. Will it be the future? Maybe. Uh, so I might have to always update it, but we will see.
When Elias Brotberger goes to work, he doesn't need ID. And he doesn't need money. In fact, much of what he needs to get through the day is hidden right there, just below the surface, in his hand. You like to touch it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, weird. Yeah, it's yeah. like a grain of rice. Yeah, a grain of rice. Embedded in his hand is a microchip that serves as his keys, his ID, and his wallet. Yeah, it's all in chip, so I use it like to get around the building. Buy snacks. Yeah, exactly. Let's buy some snacks. Exactly. So I can't open it? No. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to first blip my chip, and it will log me in, mm -hmm. and from there I get access to the fridge. Popular TV shows like Black Mirror have imagined chips as part of a dystopian future. Install ingrain procedure with local anesthetic and you're good to go. In Sweden, the microchips are already here. The microchip implants use the same technology that's in contactless credit cards. Which have made cash pretty much obsolete in Sweden. No cash. At this tech fair, a chipping event for those on the cutting edge, merging their hands with this new technology. I thought it would be fun, right? The process is simple and swift. A pinch of the skin, and in a matter of seconds, the chip is inserted. The transformation is complete. As for the pain... I barely felt it. But even in this nation of early adopters, not everyone is racing to get chipped. I feel less human. I will feel like a robot. I think, I mean, it's so much more data can go into this, you know, when it's in your body. There's no central registry tracking how many people are chipped, but biohacker Hannes Wellblood estimates between five and 10,000. In the future, do you think everyone is going to be chipped? I think it'll be voluntary, but I am certainly convinced that millions of people will find it very, very valuable to have a smart device under their skin. Human microchipping may be our future. But in Sweden, it's already reality. Sarah Harmon, NBC News, Stockholm. In a dimly lit temple, worshippers gather to listen to ancient Buddhist teachings, delivered by a robot. The robot introduces itself as the Buddhist goddess of mercy. According to faith, this deity can appear in any form. The robotic preacher is known as Mindar. It's the brainchild of temple steward Tencho Goto, who's hoping to bring worshippers closer to the divine. Many Buddhist statues have been made, but they were all just Buddhist images, standing or sitting figures. I wanted to create a Buddhist statue which can speak, make eye contact, and answer questions so that people can feel closer to it. His vision was fulfilled with the help of a robotics team from Osaka University. Mindar's hands and face are made from silicon, enabling the robot to gesture and talk. We have succeeded in creating a robotic statue that can convey messages to people interactively. Temple officials say Mindar has proven a hit with the crowds, despite initial skepticism. I thought it would be a little scary. But then I actually came to see it and found it very beautiful. The way the android speaks like a real human being made me, personally, feel very close to it. Tencho Goto hopes Minda will be the first of many androids to deliver the teachings of Buddhism, the high-tech way. Robots may in the future be able to do more than what us monks can do. Enlightenment with a futuristic twist, perhaps coming soon to a temple near you. If at first the idea is not absurd, then there's no hope for it. Albert Einstein 
people of the world, welcome to The Giant. The visitor attraction for the 21st century. The exhibition space featuring the giant experience, a glorious celebration of the great men and women of your country, inventors, artists, scientists, celebrities and athletes. The viewing tower. See the city from the shoulders of a giant. The roof garden. New dimensions in retail, gastronomy and special events for diversity of occasions. The world's tallest moving sculpture. Its head moves. Its arms move. It speaks and sings. A place to behold heroes and superheroes. A space to celebrate the great and the good. The game changers. The icons of your city and country. Every hour, the giant transforms into an extraordinary person. From sports, science, characters, your favorite heroes and recites poetry and words of wisdom to the crowds below. A space to celebrate the great and the good. The great men and women who have made this world a better place to live in. A digital canvas for artistic creation. A creative canvas like no other. A digital art gallery in the sky that displays masterpieces from today and throughout the ages. The giant brings artists together from throughout the world. A beacon for brand celebration. A new, eye-catching platform for businesses to reach customers in a novel and memorable way. A giant opportunity. A business model that delivers world-class experiences and world-class profits. An economic stimulator that enhances tourism job creation, footfall, and commercial activity in the city. Join the Giants movement. The world's largest selfie. An homage to human potential. The world's most awe-inspiring selfie. Visitors are scanned and instantly become a giant. An experience to share and remember for a lifetime. There's nothing like it on the planet. Imagine you can be the giant. The giant transforms into a stage and a backdrop for festivals, concerts, performances and special events. Let the party begin! If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. The Giant. Coming to 21 cities in 2021. Awaken the giant in you.
before I hand over to you gentlemen, I think the, the one thing I took out of that is how really advanced we are in technology, in knowledge, but also in deception. There, all I saw there was idolatry, especially with this giant concept. Uh, nowhere for God to be found in that. Uh, it's all about self, lovers of self. And um, it's actually stunning to watch. But uh, Baruch, I'll hand over to you for your comments, first of all. Well, what spoke to me about that presentation is that so much of it's based upon falsehood, on fantasy, on escaping reality, choosing what we want, the celebrity, the, the athlete, whoever it is, everything's to our liking. It, it focuses on man. And as you pointed out, where is God? Where is true worship? And it's all based in corruption, self, pride, and our ability to choose apart from what the word of God would have us to choose. So it is certainly satanic. It's certainly moving us away. And, and that's what the enemy wants to do, to move us away from truth. Through any means, he is not particular on what he'll use. He'll use anything in order to move us away from biblical truth. So that's the danger. Great. Pastor Marco, what would you say uh, after watching that video? Uh, incredible. First of all, wow. Um, the ideas that the world is uh, proposing and putting out for young people, especially uh, because technology has become such a part of our lives and such a part of it's, it's intricate in, in society. It's it's you can't really pull it away anymore. It's you know it's it's in our it's in our hands. It's in our TVs. It's in our it's in, it, from phones to cars everywhere we go. It, it is inundated our world, and therefore it's very difficult to escape. And uh, people that are embroiled in this uh, see technology as as a means of salvation. And, and people have certainly have seen it. Uh, for hundreds of years, they looked at science, they looked at man, they looked at uh, the inventions of man as a way to uh, advance us into a greater uh, humanity. And, and, you know, certainly the ideas of evolutions are, are quite, quite there. Um, it's amazing to think that after all these years, coming back to scripture, the Bible details this in such a way that puts these prophecies, these puts these events at the end of the age where man would try to reach a Tower of Babylon scenario again, mm -hmm. that nothing that we can imagine, you know, the, 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 the whole idea of Babylon, that they could, they could do everything that he could imagine. Nothing is kept from us. Not, and even God says, you know what, if, if unless God stops it, you know, what they plan to do, they're going to accomplish it. God had to intervene in the Tower of Babylon to put a stop to it. Uh, well, God's going to do the same. But before we get to that part in the book of Revelation, uh, we see that technology is moving further and further, um, away, moving us away from God, from the truth of God, for the dependence on God, to now a dependence on human, made in our image and likeness, not made in his image and likeness. And therefore, we're going to create something that is made in our image, whether it's robotics, artificial intelligence, it's all made in man's image. And ultimately, it's going to lead to the worship of the Antichrist in the image of the beast. What we saw in the video, what we watched on the video, there's no doubt is the precursor to the image of the beast, the, the worship of the image of the beast, the permission to have a mark of some sort uh, on the hand and on the forehead to be able to be part of society, to be able to in, be involved in society, in the economy of uh, economic system of the world. Uh, even uh, Baruch talked about, Dr. Baruch spoke about the World Economic Forum. They made it clear that's what they want to do. They want to chip people. Uh, and, and put them under a control factor in which they will not be able to do anything unless it's been given them authority. And, and of course, they're the ones who will give the authority. And so we're, we're seeing the precursors. There's no doubt this is a ripple effect that will have um, incredible repercussions in our lives. Uh, I don't know how long, you know, but we, we're seeing things that the Bible spoke about very clearly regarding the book of Revelation, regarding the book of Daniel. And uh, you're seeing humanity migrate uh, more and more toward this. And eventually, um, uh, as, as Dr. Rook pointed out as well, it, it is going to lead to a satanic worship. Uh, the Antichrist will be worshipped and uh, it's going to be Satan incarnate. Just like as much Jesus was God incarnate, Satan's going to want his 
a man to be possessed by Satan. And that's what he's going to get. But before that, you know, don't forget that there's a false prophet who leads all this cheerleading of this man and will impose this mark uh, as well as the image of the beast. And, and scholars from many hundreds of years, centuries have, you know, have boggled their minds. How can this work? How can this be? How can this be an image? And you, you read some of these old, old commentaries and they, 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 they wrestle with the scriptures and trying to figure out what these things were like and what will they be like. Yeah. And um, I think now um, we, we probably getting a better picture of what it could be. I'm not, I'm not dogmatic in saying this is it, this is it, this is it. But I could surely see that the road is being paved and, um, and, and we must pay close attention to Bible prophecy now. And, and the sad part about it is, you know, many churches, many denominations don't. Yeah. And, and it is a very small part of the body of Christ now that actually uh, cares about it. Uh, pastors don't teach it. Pastors don't want to talk about it because it's controversial. Uh, they don't know it themselves because they maybe never studied it. Uh, or maybe they came from a school of thought that this was all fulfilled in 70 AD, such preterism. And uh, so they, they don't bother with it. So they don't really prepare uh, their congregation, the body of Christ, to really be prepared uh, to really know God, to really be uh, part of the Messiah, his body, to know Jesus and to be ready uh, for his soon return. And so uh, th that's my take on this. And um, mm. um, I, I think it's incredible. And I think it's, uh, it's eye opening. I think any Bible believing Christians that's looking at this should be aware and should be, be getting ready in their relationship with God and others and making, of course, the gospel uh, clear uh, to many people, because I think we're seeing things that unprecedented in human history. Correct. Baruch, uh, we saw a couple of videos there. One was, uh, of course, the Buddhist showing um, robotics and worship. Um, how, and, and then looking at that giant, how it, it was uh, promoting how it, it moves its head, it moves its arms and so forth. Do you think this is uh, preconditioning people uh, for when we see in the end times how uh, the beast and, and, and the power and the supernatural power, we know that it'll be a supernatural power from Satan released, but is that conditioning people to that kind of system? I, I agree with you. I, I, I think it very much is conditioning people for such acceptance. And we saw in, the, in that testimony from their standpoint, you know, it wasn't Christians who were making these videos. These were produced this this uh, robotic leader, religious leader, that's produced by by them. They want this, and you saw how quickly people were. I was moved by that. I heard it speaking in my language. I felt an attachment, and it's all desensitizing what is real. You know, you can't have a relationship with a robot. You have a relationship with a, another human being. You have a relationship with the son of God, you don't have a relationship with, with material, but there's going to be an emphasis on materialism. And then I believe when we look at, for example, revelation 13, and it talks about everyone's going to be commanded to make that image, but it says there that a spirit's going to go into it. So it's going to take it to a, a another dimension, meaning it's just not going to be mechanical. It's not just going to be of, of a human component, meaning we made it and such, there's going to be a spiritual, and that's what you shared a moment ago, Christian, there's going to be a spiritual dimension that is going to be amazing to people, is going to be able to say, we don't have an explanation for this. This is greater than what we've ever experienced. And it's all about replacing God. The, the Antichrist wants to lay a foundation where, where Satan replaces God. So he's going to use technology. Technology is going to be, be praised and such, but there's going to be that step up into something beyond what man can do. And this is going to be that, that final linchpin, so to speak, to move people in droves to embracing, because who is like the beast? And it's going to be that uniqueness that is going to be of an unclean, demonic, unclean spirit, something that is supernatural, that is going to amaze people.
Amen. Amen. So we're just going to look at persecution now. Uh, Christian, I mean, if, I, if, I, if I could uh, interject very quickly, of course, I, I, just, of course. I wanted to make the point before we moved on to persecution. I think it's uh, um, just to kind of finalize it. And thank you, Dr. Baruch, for explaining that very well. I think people need to understand that it is going to be supernatural according to the erge of Satan, as St. Paul tells us that in the second letter of the Thessalonians. There, there's two appearances. There's the appearance of our Messiah, of, of Jesus. And there's also going to be the appearance of the Antichrist, which is according to the erge the power of Satan. Paul uses that word, uh, as it were, Satan is energizing uh, this man. And then he'll, of course, be energizing the false prophet who speaks like a lamb, uh, who looks like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. And of course, the image will be su uh, completely di diabolically inspired uh, to deceive. Uh, I, I wanted to touch uh, very quickly on Daniel, because um, when we look at Daniel chapter 12, and it speaks about the, the sealing of the book, uh, seal up these things, Daniel, until the end. Uh, knowledge will increase. People run to and fro. Um, I also have looked at that as, a, as, as an, in a double prophetic meaning that the prophecies of Daniel will be known much better in the end times. There's going to be an increase, not only of knowledge, of true, of, of when we looked at it, absolutely true. Uh, I also believe we're going to know more things about scripture uh, in the end times, there's going to be an opening of the scriptures, and that's what I believe the book of Revelation is all about. The book of Revelation, Apocalypsos in Greek, it simply means the unveiling. It's the mm -hmm. unveiling. Uh, it's it's uh, Daniel in chapter, tw uh, John in chapter 20 is told, don't seal up this book. Don't seal up the books of this prophecy, the prophecies of this book. Don't seal them up. Um, we see that in chapter 6 of Revelation, you have the six seals. The seven seals, but the first six uh, are shown. They're unveiling what's going to happen in the world. They're unveiling what's happening in the world. Uh, I believe they're very connected to what Daniel was told to seal. Uh, John unseals it. Jesus is unsealing these things. There's an unsealing of what will happen in the end, uh, which are connected, of course, to Revelation 11, uh, Daniel 11 about the, uh, about the Antichrist, which in a way it's Antiochus. But as we move in chapter 11, it becomes more and more about the man of sin, the man of, uh, uh, the, 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 the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. So I think for believers, the encouragement, I want to encourage believers to, uh, in this, that as we see technology increasing and knowledge increasing and people becoming uh, very well known for their technological prowess, um, I also want to encourage believers that God is going to reveal more things in his word to us. Uh, we will know things more as we get into uh, further into the book of Revelation. God will open up these things to us. There'll be an unsealing of things that we didn't know a hundred years ago. We know better now. And of course, ultimately, the first six seals will, un will unseal many things, uh, which basically corresponds to Daniel 12, the un the, the, what Daniel's told to seal up, the book of Revelation, Apocalypse, to unveil, to unseal. John is told not to seal them up, and we see these things played out in Revelation chapter 6 with the seals being opened. And of course, ultimately, there is a rescue a promise in Daniel 12. There'll be a rescue in chapter 12 of Daniel. There's also a rescue uh, that I believe will happen between the sixth and seventh seal, uh, that, that the church, the body of Christ, will be uh, will be delivered, will be rescued before the wrath of God comes. And so I, I, I do believe it corresponds to Daniel chapter 12, looking at Revelation 6. A much deeper study is needed. I'm only just touching the surface sure. on it yeah. just to encourage uh, believers to, to know that as you, with your Bible and with the illumination of the Holy Spirit, uh, God will reveal things to us more and more. He who has wisdom, let him count the number of the beasts, it says in the book of Revelation, there's going to be people that are going to be wise. God's going to give them wisdom. Uh, the wise will understand, it says in Daniel 12, but the wicked will not understand. And therefore, God will illuminate uh, to believers who are uh, leading many people to righteousness, it says in Daniel 12. Those who lead to people to righteousness will shine like the stars in the firmament. So I, I believe there's going to be also an illumination of God's spirit for the believers in the last days. As they seek God in these things and um, things of the end, God will give forth his word and will give us insight into things that we don't know today. I, I would like to say that um, I know more about the scriptures now than I did 20 years ago 
or 20 some years ago when I first became a Christian. But I also know that as the Lord gives us life and gives us the grace to continue, we go into this time, the, uh, the end of the age, we will know more in the future that we do now uh, because Bible prophecy is going to come true. Things are going to be opening up that we never realize that uh, or, or thought possible that the unsealing of these things will be in our lifetime. Now, I'm not setting dates. I know when please misunderstand me, I'm not setting dates. I'm putting any kind of uh, limits onto what God is able to do, whether he can draw this out further or not. Uh, but I do believe that the prophecies of Daniel, um, which is the book of Revelation, going to be unsealing them, is connected. Um, we will see things that um, uh, perhaps uh, we never thought possible in, in Scripture. We never really realized how much is in Scripture and how much God has revealed to us uh, in his word. Appreciate your comments. Baruch, why do you think, I mean, Pastor Marco touched on something very important there as well, that, um, you know, there is a reluctance, not everyone, but there is a reluctance sometimes in churches to teach prophetic, uh, the prophetic. Why do you think that is? And how do you see, what's your message to believers about spending more time in the word, seeking that guidance of the Holy Spirit to reveal his word to us? The question is, is someone kingdom minded? If you're anxious for the kingdom of God, you're passionate about that, you desire it and you're committed to kingdom truth, you're going to want to know the scriptures concerning the last days, this transition period that moves from what it was and is to what it will be. So the more kingdom minded someone is, the more of interest they're going to have in the book of Revelation, in, in prophecy, both in the Old and New Testaments. But unfortunately, in the same way that the disciples, you know, Peter, for example, there's a biblical relationship when the, when the scripture speaks about resurrection, it's almost always connected to a kingdom application. And, and the disciples, they, they did not believe. Messiah says, you know, I'm going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be, be put to death, crucified. But on the third day, I'll rise again. It seems as though no one expected the resurrection. One lady expected him to die and be buried, the lady who anointed him. But no one went to the tomb expecting the resurrection. And from a theological standpoint, it simply shows People are not kingdom-minded. And I think that was something that plagued the early disciples, and it's something that's plaguing the church at large today. We're not kingdom-minded. Therefore, those things connected to the transition into the kingdom, people aren't interested in. Mm. Yeah, now you're spot on, Brooke. Um, let's now look at another video that will highlight uh, where we're at these days with persecution. Uh, the Lord told us about an increase in persecution, clearly in his words. So let's just have it a short few minute clips on this. The Christian NGO Open Doors once again reports of increasing persecution of Christians worldwide. It certifies that some 245 million Christians worldwide suffered some form of persecution. In other words, one in nine Christians are persecuted because of their faith. Out of the 150 countries examined, Open Doors found 73 with a high, very high or extreme level of persecution. Five years ago, there was only talk of extreme persecution in North Korea. Now 10 more countries added to the list. Once again, Kim Jong-un's country is the first on the list. It is not known how many Christians are imprisoned in their re-education camps. Just possessing a Bible can mean death or jail, not only for those who possess it, but even for three generations of the same family. In Afghanistan, abandoning Islam is seen as a betrayal and can be punished even with death. Christians are obliged to practice their faith in secret. Even if a person is suspected of being in contact with someone of another religion, he or she can also be condemned to death. Somalia is the third country in this list of intolerant countries. The church has practically disappeared in a country where chaos has reigned for decades. Socially, being Somali is identified with being Muslim, so the few Christians who remain in the country have to practice their faith in secret. The jihadist militia Al-Shaab kills anyone suspected of abandoning Islam. 
In a war-torn Libya, many converts from Islam are persecuted by their own family. It is impossible to identify as a Christian. Thousands of Subharans who cross the country to reach Europe fall victim to human trafficking networks. If they are Christians, their fate can become even more terrible as they are victims of horrendous torture and rape. The last of the five countries where Christians are treated the worst is Pakistan. There, the anti-blasphemy law is a danger to Christians who may be condemned to death. One example is Asiya Bibi, who was released after eight years of inhuman imprisonment. Christians are also regarded as second-class citizens and therefore despised. In countries such as Iraq, the situation has improved slightly for Christians after the disappearance of the Islamic State. Last year, they were number 10 in the ranking, and this year, they are number 13. However, there is concern about other countries such as Morocco returning to the list, since Open Door certifies that the situation for Christians has worsened. February 1st, 2021. Public security police storm onto the property of a government-sanctioned church in China's Wenzhou City. Their mission? Toppling a cross from the roof of a church building for a second time. They'd removed the cross seven years earlier, but church members replaced it. Bob Fu is with China Aid, a group that helps China's persecuted Christians. That city alone, we have documented over 1,600 churches with their crosses were being burnt, destroyed, and destructed. And um, many pastors, you know, were even detained, imprisoned. China's Christians say it's the worst persecution against them since Chairman Mao Zedong. To use Ambassador uh, 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 Sam Brombeck's word, uh, it's a war against the faith. I think it's a war against the independent faith. And it's no longer limited to certain regions of China. VOM's Todd Nettleton says this massive wave of Christian persecution is widespread, and it's coming from the national government. What we say in 2021 is that everywhere in China, there is intense persecution of Christians. There is intense uh, efforts to control the church, to bring the church under Communist Party control. The crackdown is affecting every Christian in China, says Nettleton. Protestants, Catholics, government registered churches and unregistered house churches. And the Chinese Communist Party has a new excuse for targeting Christians. Now, under this the pretext of uh, COVID-19 coronavirus, um, the Chinese Communist Party has intensified its persecution by banning all the church activities, even those services or worship uh, or prayer meetings in believers' own homes uh, with their own family members. July 22, 2020, a loud knock on the door at the home of a woman in China's Yemen city. She tells the police outside they cannot enter her home without a permit. Moments later, they destroy the lock and enter anyway, breaking up what the government says is an illegal meeting. Fu says it's all part of President Xi Jinping's campaign of sinicization, which means Christians are only considered to be good citizens if they adhere to communist ideology. Right now, today, in places around the world, the church is on fire. Christians are persecuted for their faith. Dictators treat Jesus like competition, trying to stamp out any allegiance besides the government. Christians are being threatened by their families, watching their homes and churches be reduced to rubble and killed. Christians in these places are put in the flames of persecution. They are standing in the furnace and they are being asked to deny Christ so they can live. And in the fire, they still follow Jesus. They're saying, yes, I choose Jesus. These Christians are on fire for Jesus. God is doing work through his people all over the world, and they are part of our family, part of your family. So today, what can you do to help your global family stand strong in the fire? And what can you do to help them remain on fire for Jesus? The church is on fire. Will you help? An interesting uh, video there highlighting how persecution is increasing uh, throughout the world. Um, and, and the Lord, like I said before the clip, he clearly warned us about this, that persecution would be on the increase. And we're seeing quite a lot of that. Um, you know, just before I hand over to you, Baruch, for some of your comments in regards, and we're going to look at some scriptures now specifically uh, talking about persecution. 
Uh, Pastor Marco, what, what, what's the, the environment like there in the USA? We see a lot in the media. We know that a lot of the information isn't correct in the media, but under the Biden administration, uh, how is the environment currently in the USA in terms of persecution against believers? For the first time in the Western world, we are seeing uh, the governments, governments who were supposed to be either democratic or in a republic, as it is, as the United States should have been, or should should be, um, we're seeing Western powers turning against uh, the Christian faith, mm-hmm. and they've done it very, very surreptitiously. They've done it very slow and they're very very methodical, meaning that it is not full frontal yet to the degree that we would say China or North Korea where it's, it's completely engaged um, against believers like in the Middle East. Uh, but we're seeing it through the courts. We've been seeing it through um, the indictment of people that are considered patriots, people that, uh, let's say, follow a certain ideology, whether it's conservatism, whether it's republicanism, whether they're followers of, of, of the ex-president Donald Trump. Uh, because Christians, believers, Bible-believing Christians, um, would encompass perhaps um, many of these 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 isms, right? They they they, they may be more conservative. They may be more uh, in the Republican Party. They may have been followers or, or voted at least for Trump. There, the 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 governments, our current government, Department of Justice, FBI, CIA, NSA, have really honed into that. One of the troubles in America is these Christians these patriots, these conservatives who stand in the way of progress, whether it's uh, against the, uh, what they say, it's we stand in the way of progress of, of LGBT, of transgenderism. We stand the way of progress of technology. We stand the way of progress of Marxism and Leninist ideologies, critical race theory, intersectionality, all these these buzzwords that are in our world today. Uh, the, 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 the government sees Christians as the impediment of them bringing this social utopia into our society and therefore uh we've seen it in the um in 2020 when everything went locked down in america they locked down specifically churches and i Mm. i shouldn't say everything got locked down Uh, certainly um marijuana shops were open certainly abortion clinics were open yes certainly liquor stores were open and in volumes at a at a degree that we've never seen in america people uh, but drugs and alcohol, and we're, we're pretty much smoking weed and getting drunk specifically throughout 2020. Uh, those things kept open, evil kept open, vices kept open, uh, but the government, especially uh, like in California, which is it's, it's a more liberal state and where I reside in, uh, came down on churches where we couldn't sing, we couldn't pray, we couldn't meet together. And therefore there was this lashback against the church. Um, and, and so we've seen the tide begins to turn. The tide has already turned, in my opinion. The rhetoric, rhetoric has been there, and they've been using the courts. Jesus spoke this very clearly. They will bring you before courts and magistrates. They will bring you in to give testimony, and, and he encourages us not to worry uh, when these things happen because the Holy Spirit will give us what to say in those situations. Uh, but certainly we have seen that now. Courts uh, have struck down many things that in the past would have been in favor of say churches or people of faith, loosely uh, terminology there. Uh, now it's, it's very harsh. It's a very harsh treatment of Christians, harsh treatment of, of believers. I, and I mean that in a, in, a, in a very clear way. It is not persecution like in other countries, but the tide has been turning. Sure. Uh, Canada I think it's a barometer and certainly Australia, Christian, it's certainly a barometer. Maybe New Zealand will be the other example where um, we already seen um, the government in uh, in Canada arrest pastors uh, for simply having a meeting, for simply having a meeting with the actually the the amount of people that was required by the ordinances of their provinces. Uh, sometimes they met outside. Sometimes it wasn't even an indoor meeting. And yet the government came in, arrested the pastor, arrested some of the congregations that were, were resistant of it, of course, but the pastors got the, um, the main brunt of it. We've seen churches burnt. Uh, even, even today, um, there was, I think it was a total of 45 churches that have been burnt 
um, in, in a span of about a month in Canada. And yet the government, uh, which is supposed to be a quote unquote, a democratic government parliament, um, certainly with more freedoms than other countries have turned a blind eye. And even some of the, the, the parliament leaders have actually said that they, uh, that there was expected lashback from people that were not of faith against people of faith. And so we've seen the, the winds of change. Yep. I think Christians in the Western world uh, need to be aware yes. of what is happening, take an account of who they, who they belong to, that their citizenship is not in heaven. It's not here. It's in heaven, not on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. When the Lord comes, you know, we, he, will, he will resurrect us. He will glorify us. And therefore, we, we are not to take stock in this world. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yeah. to the point that in First John, we're told by uh, uh, John the Apostle, not to love this world or the things of the world. Because everything of the world is not from God. And then he begins to speak about the Antichrist in verse 18. Uh, in, in speaking about the love of the world, he uh, relates that to, the, to, the, to Antichrist, which is ultimately uh, what leads to that. Of course, people that love the world will love the Antichrist. People that love this world will give everything up for the worship of Antichrist. So uh, my, my, my encouragement to believers in America is to, to be aware, to know what is happening. Uh, whatever's left of the Constitution is not much. And uh, we have to pray for our country. We have to pray for boldness. Uh, but do realize that it is not the America of your father or of your grandfather. It, it is certainly um, a government that is uh, against um, the Christian faith, no doubt. Correct, correct. Uh, we're going to start looking at some scriptures. Um, now, the reason for that, well, scripture is the most important thing we have these days. But uh, I've had some believers that actually tell me, because they are listening to the wrong type of messages, whether it be the New Apostolic Reformation, that, you know, your best life is now. Uh, which is a very dangerous thing to say. I mean, if your best life is now, well, you probably deserve that. But uh, your 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 eternal life is is not looking too good. But um, I think that a lot of them are actually saying, well, no, you know, it's those seven mountains that also Bethel Church keep going on about that. You know, everything has to be great here on earth for the Lord's return. We're going to be looking at some scriptures now, so I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. And so Revelation 13, verses 16 to 17, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their forehead, and that no one can buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Baruch, over to you for your uh, commentary on this scripture. It, it ties in with the first video we saw in terms of technology. We've discussed that, how it's setting the stage for what is to come. Over to you for your commentary. Yeah, we, we don't know what that mark is, mm -hmm. in fact, going to be. But we do know a couple things. We know, as you pointed out earlier, Christian, it's one who pledges absolute loyalty, allegiance to the beast and the ruler. So that empire that's coming and the ruler who's going to rule over that, that empire. But I think what oftentimes people miss is a, a biblical basis when I hear something that's placed on my forehand or my forearm, I think about tefillin, which, which all relate to the commandments of God. And what I see here is a change. You are either going to think on their forehead. The rabbis teach that has to do with thinking, having a mindset rooted in the instructions of God, and on your arm, having to do with doing the instructions of God. So people are going to be challenged. What am I going to do? Am I submitting to the commandments of God or am I going to replace the commandments of God with the commandments of the Antichrist empire, what they want? And the, the pressure is, well, if you don't, you will not be able to conduct commerce. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how wealthy you are, what you possess, you're not going to be able to utilize those resources. So you may have your home full of gold, but you're not good. It'll be forbidden for anyone to do business with you. And, and something else that I like to just say in, in regard to that time period when that's going to be happening, we're seeing the foundation, and that is a lack of privacy. Mm -hmm. Now, privacy is important. 
We see in the U.S., I'm in Israel, but in the U.S. Constitution, there's many points of privacy. This is being eroded greatly in the United States and in other nations where they're removing privacy. When knowledge increased, they want to know more and more about each individual. They're collecting data constantly about them, about each individual to see where do they fit? Are they going to be loyal or are they going to be a problem, a deplorable one, as one candidate was speaking about some time ago? Where are we going to go in? And I know because of the coronavirus, for example, I had to, if I'm going to be vaccinated and be allowed into a hotel, be allowed into a restaurant and such here in Israel, you have to download an app, register with it so that you can, when they ask you for this, this document that shows that you are vaccinated, well, they also monitor. Now, once you have that, they monitor you. And every time I go into a different place in Israel, it comes up on my phone, welcome to this location. They give me the information about the so-called coronavirus, what's going on there and everything. And it's tracking. And this is what they want to do. They want to be able to track. And what we find is oppressive regimes. Uh, Marco mentioned uh, North Korea and China and these very repressive governments. They also want to track people. They want all the information that they can have on every individual. So the more government is wanting to gather information, that lays the foundation for oppressive policies. We see, for example, in Nazi Germany, them wanting to utilize health insurance, health coverage, all of that for the purpose of gathering information. If you're an American, you know how, how the Affordable Care Act also is getting much information that used to be private. In America, your own personal medical information, there's private. They have abortion on demand, all based upon privacy, which is a, a great misnomer. But the point is, now they're going to want to send people to your door if you haven't been vaccinated to encourage you, to pressure you and such. Yeah. So sure. a lack of privacy is very telling. And it's all about an increase of knowledge of the individual. And all of this is going to be related to, in my opinion, the mark of the beast that you're mentioning in Revelation 13. Amen. Great. Now, uh, there's, there's two things that I wanted to touch on here in terms of, you know, we're going to see an increase in the end days. But uh, he tells us in 2 Timothy, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Uh, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unfaithful and unholy. But then in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, we're instructed, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I think also I touched on those videos that we saw, um, especially with the giant and things of that nature, that it's all self-centered. It's all about men being lovers of themselves and idolatry as well. So, Pastor Marco, what are your views on that? in terms of these two scriptures being so prophetic and clear about what we're seeing today. No doubt, Paul, speaking under the inspiration of the spirit, uh, looked at the end times, looked at things that we're uh, seeing today. And um, in first, both in first Timothy and second Timothy, he speaks of apostasy, deception. He speaks of uh, believers maintaining purity, a purity of doctrine, uh, being able to teach others, and uh, even encouraging, you know, others to uh, raise up godly men, uh, Paul tells Timothy, to they can teach others. So there's this need for discipleship and growth. Uh, why? And, and obviously, chapter three, as we get to the end of the letter, speaks of um, that this that Paul understood that as the Spirit was pointing these things out. And in, in, in the first letter, he says that the, the Spirit is actually specifically pointing these things to 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 um, to Paul. Uh, about the end times, about things of the end, um, men will be lovers of themselves, and then that's the ultimate sin. It's when we don't love God, yeah. and and when something takes the vacuum, something fills the vacuum, it, and it's 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 us. It's 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 what the Antichrist will be worshipped is the reason why he's worshipped is because he is man. He's the idea of six 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 has his number of men 
repeat it three times. You know, seven is the number for God and number of completion. You see it in the book of Revelation quite a bit, the number seven. Well, man has a number and it's the number of a man. It's a number of 666 is when man tries to usurp the place of God and the place of worship that only God deserves and he's 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 worthy of it we're told in revelation 4 and 5 both the father and of the lamb um but they're going to turn over to that uh, from that and place it upon literally will be themselves that they're worshiping the image of the, of the beast or the antichrist and ultimately be satan and and yeah. that's at the at the heart of it is that they're going to do satan's bid they're going to follow satan's desires and so but you can see here lovers of money the, the whole a whole system runs on money yeah everything we have sayings right it's all about the money follow the money we we have even you know uh, nuances in our world that deals with money boasters proud blasphemers disobedience to parents unthankful unholy all these things are are very much part of our of our world system these things are almost they they looked upon as a badge of honor now yeah yeah Something about disobedient to parents and how the media plays such a role in society to pull children from the parents. I mean, even in our society here in America, we, we have this idea that teachers know better than the parents mm. and teachers influence the the, the, the the children a lot more than the parents. We have basically, unfortunately, vacated the position of parents and we have allowed teachers, perfect strangers to, yeah. you know, a lot of us, you know, I homeschool my kids, so we didn't have to go through that part, but they vacated the position of parenting and instructing their children. And, and I say that even about, about Christian parents, yeah. that sending them off to indoctrination camps. Um, and, and, and I get it, some people can't do homeschooling, but it's becoming more clear more and more now that there's a need for that. That's a side point and I won't, I won't touch on that right now that we get into a rabbit trail there. Uh, but you could see how this is becoming part of our society, uh, the unthankfulness, the unholy. And Paul the Apostle make clear here, he actually says, avoid these people holding a form of godliness yeah. uh I, I have a um, not only do i believe this is applies to the world and the end of the age uh but unfortunately uh my brothers i do believe this is a state of the church in the end of the age and mm. the false church will emerge from this because paul says from these people turn away from yeah. uh, they have a form of godliness they, they, they appear to be righteous they appear to be godly but they deny the power thereof. Not only do they deny the power of God's word, the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, but the power of the Holy Spirit, which is what illuminates the scriptures to us. And therefore that ultimately leads to 1 Corinthians 10, idolatry. Yep. And Paul was writing this to Christians in, in 1 Corinthians. He's writing to believers. Uh, you know, the, the idea here is that there is that temptation to go toward idolatry. And the ultimate idolatry is what the Antichrist will offer. He'll offer the world. He'll offer the things of the world, which John tells us not to love and not to desire them. Uh, but the, the, the idea of Antichrist is exactly that, one who takes the place of Christ. Antichristo in Greek, vicarious Christos in Latin, whatever you want to call it, whichever language you use, it is simply means somebody in place of Christ. Christ. Correct. It does mean against, and which is, you know, when we think of Antichrist, we think of somebody against Christ. And that is true. He is against Christ. But the primary meaning, it's somebody who replaces Christ in your life, in your heart, in your love, in your affection. It is, he is replaced by someone who offers you, as Jesus was offered, the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus did not comply. Jesus told, said that we should only worship God. So he told us what we ought to do when that temptation comes. Uh, but unfortunately, um, you know, as Paul is writing this, and I, I probably will assume with, with many tears, as he's written in other scriptures uh, about the, the, what he felt for the church and the tears and the sorrow that he felt when Christians were going the wrong way. Um, you know, we ought to feel the same way when the church, the churches and Christians head down this road, um, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And, and that's what we're up against. I, I don't want to be... Um, I hate using the word negative or anything like that, or defeated, because we're not defeated. You know, thank yeah. God to, through Jesus Christ who leads us to victory. But the, the 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 realization and the reality is, most of the church, the state of the church, is what Second Timothy three is describing. Yep, absolutely. Let's move on to some other scriptures. 
So we're looking at uh, John 15, 19 to 20. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Baruch, over to you for some of your commentary here in terms of, um, you know, clearly we're looking at here that, you know, we're told that if they persecuted him, they will also persecute us when we stand for, for the gospel and Yeshua Messiah. Over to you. Just two things. First of all, it's either of the world or of the kingdom. There's no other place and people are going to have to make a decision. What is their heart committed to, the kingdom or the world? As, as Marco said, the Antichrist is about the world. The Antichrist is about the things of the world. We're about true believers, the things of the kingdom and the character of the kingdom. And when you're kingdom minded, it goes to the last part. We're going to be interested in keeping his word, obeying his word. So many times I get criticism because I speak too much about obedience, people will tell me. Well, it's obedience to the instructions of God. That's a good thing. But so often there's a, a disconnect in many within the church about obedience is, is being taught almost as a bad thing. It's a, a legalism. We're not speaking about little legalism. We're talking about faithfulness. And then the final thing is that, as you pointed out, a servant of Messiah is going to be hated. They're going to be persecuted. The Bible's clear about that as we move into what the previous scripture said, perilous times. Mm -hmm. What is in the horizon are perilous things, persecutions, hatred for those who are faithful to the teachings of, of Messiah Yeshua, of Jesus Christ. And that truth is, is lost today within many, many churches, sadly. And this, I believe, is one of the purposes that, that we do these discussion videos is because people need to wake up to what is coming and is going to be coming quickly. And in many places in the world are already there for numerous uh, faithful believers. They're suffering in many countries already today. Yeah, correct. And, and brothers and sisters, for everyone watching, once again, like Marco said and Baruch has said, it's not about, about us being negative. It's about us looking at scripture, what it clearly says, and how we need to be prepared for what's to come. The Lord gave us the great tools to, for us to be prepared. His word, I mean, we know his word is sharper than a double-edged sword. It's eternal. And he's given us his perfect word word, so that we can be prepared for what's to come. I want to look at Matthew uh, verse, uh, chapter 5, 10 to 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The, the, the thing that I take away from this scripture is so clear that he's, he's clearly telling us that we will see persecution. I don't see anywhere in uh, prophetic end time scriptures that it says that everything's going to be like they say hunky-dory or biscuits and gravy and sweet cheese. I don't see that. It's clearly telling us here about persecution. Just before I hand over to you, Marco, just Baruch, what, what are your comments on this scripture as well? One thing I think it's so significant for as they persecuted the prophets before you, mm. if we're going to be persecuted, true believers, it's because we're prophetically driven. We hear the words of the prophets. We apply them. We're in that same, same commitment, that same character. And one last thing in the book of Revelation, it speaks so frequently about my servants, the prophets, my servants, the prophets. And it's not necessarily speaking about modern day prophets, but those who submit to the revelation of the prophets of the Bible. Correct. Marco, any comments before I move on to the next scripture? Yes. Um, persecution does two things. It is of the devil. There's no doubt about it. Persecution is of the devil. It, it is not from God. Um, God allows it. God um, 
um, permits it, you would say in, in, in so many terms. I'm trying to uh, just kind of describe the idea here of persecution because persecution is certainly from, from the devil. It, it says in the book of Revelation, Jesus to the church uh, um, of uh, um, it's Smyrna, the church of Smyrna, uh, that it was Satan who was behind uh, their persecution, it was Satan who was behind their oppression. And so we see that it's Satan, the dragon, who comes after the woman. We see that Satan, the dragon, who comes after those who, uh, those who are going to overcome him uh, by their power, the testimony, and the blood of the lamb. The persecution that God allows, in a very real way, it is a cleansing of the church, uh, of those who are totally committed to Jesus Christ as Messiah, as our Lord, and those who hold the form of godliness, as we read the other scripture earlier, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes a necessary evil to clean out the dross, to, to clean out the dead wood within the body of Christ. You see that in the book of Acts, where there were people that did not want to join the, 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 the church. Uh, they were afraid of joining the church for many reasons, but one of the ideas is that they lived such holy lives. And when the persecution came, uh, it actually brought forth the boldness and the power of the Holy Spirit in the believers' lives. And they went about preaching, it says, after Stephen's death, a, a great persecution arose. And they went about preaching the gospel from every in every direction, including Samaria, which we see Philip ended up there. Uh, but the persecution becomes a necessary evil in these days to clean out the fake, to clean out the falsehood. Um, unfortunately, uh, true believers, true righteous believers, uh, get persecuted. But the words of our Lord here comfort us in the fact that uh, this is nothing that we are to be uh, surprised. This is nothing that we're to be uh, wondering, you know, why is this happening to me? It happened to him. Yeah. And if we're yeah. going to emulate our master, if you're going to emulate our Messiah, he was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He was a man who suffered tremendous things, rejected by men. And so he's encouraging us here not to take not to maximize it and say, well, it's such a terrible thing. Look how much we're persecuted and this is horrible. It is terrible. But it's also to remind us that uh, as we, we see it in perspective, we, we minimize it in a way that the perspective is there's a greater aspect to it that we don't realize, which is, you know, the, the, the comfort of the Lord. The perspective of Jesus is that we are to be, um, we're, we're blessed as we're being persecuted because we're persecuted for his sake, for righteousness sake, for his sake. And therefore we are to be glad um, just like the apostles were to, to actually be, be worthy to suffer like Jesus. Yeah. And so I've met believers who've been persecuted, physically persecuted, incredibly godly people, incredibly godly, incredibly committed to Jesus. And they see it not as a, it is very painful and I can never, uh, I, I am not able to speak on it eloquently because I have never suffered in that way for mm -hmm. Jesus. But I know that all of us must be willing to suffer mm -hmm. for Jesus in those in, in, the, in those terms because uh, it could happen to us. And it's certainly it's approaching. Uh, he says, great is your reward in heaven, just like they persecuted the prophets. In the book of Revelation 12, we're told that they overcame him. They overcame the dragon. They overcame, of course, ultimately the kingdom of the Antichrist and the Antichrist himself because of the blood of the lamb and the power of the testimony, because they did not love their lives until uh, they did not love their life, even when faced with death. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's interesting you say that because a lot of Christians will quote that scripture, but they'll only leave it until, you know, uh, they overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb or by the word of their testimony, but they'll leave it at that. Yeah. They won't read the continuation. So uh, I, I'm glad you pointed that out. But Baruch, question for you. When we look at here, when you, the Lord tells us, you know, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for your uh, great is your reward in heaven. Uh, is that also an issue with believers these days that they're not kingdom minded, that they're not look at eternal things. They're focusing more on now. Before you answer, though, I, I by all means, I can understand just like Marco, I've never been persecuted that way. So I certainly can't say that I know what they're going through. You know, persecution must be a horrible, horrible thing. But when sometimes in the Western world, people have a little bit of persecution, um, a lot of the times people will just sadly give up. Um, 
and, and they'll compromise. Is that, do you think, Baruch, is that one of the reasons, it could be many reasons, but one of the reasons could it be that they're not kingdom-minded, they're, they're not thinking about eternal uh, and rather thinking more about now? Absolutely. Simply, the answer is yes to what you say. They're not really believing about the promises, the reward. So if we focus on the kingdom and the rewards of the kingdom, it's going to encourage us, strengthen us. And also, and this is a, a vital aspect, when we're kingdom-minded, it's going to give us better discernment so we can make righteous, God-pleasing decisions. Yes. So kingdom-minded is really foundational for living faithfully in the midst of persecution. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to look at Revelation here because it's a, it's a very important scripture in Revelation 2, verses 10 to 11. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. I want to come back to that, Baruch, but I'll continue the scripture. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Clearly, once again, we're told here that difficult times will come. Uh, but just your commentary, Baruch, not only in the scripture, the whole scripture, but I'm interested what your view is when it says, and you will have tribulation 10 days. Over to you, Baruch. Oftentimes, number 10 relates to complete or entirety. We're going to suffer this, this tribulation, and here again, we always need to make a distinction between tribulation and the wrath of God. We are pr promised we will not experience the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. But there's no scripture that says that we won't suffer tribulation. In fact, I know several scripture. One, Acts 14, verse 22, that says it's necessary to enter into the kingdom of God to go through much tribulation. Yes. So tribulation is what we should be expecting not the wrath of God. But this is specifically speaking to, to a church, believers, about a period of time, whether it's a literal 10 days or whether it just simply speaks about going through in its entirety a time of tribulation, that, that's debatable. But, but notice what he says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. The question is, is that crown important to you? Mm. Is it something that, that you really believe is being able to, to receive because of perseverance, endurance? And unfortunately, when we look at the most popular Christian books, those who are the most popular preachers, the ones who fill up stadiums, they are, are giving a message, nothing compared to this. They're giving a message very similar to what that big giant that we saw earlier was, was all about and what he could do for you and how it would tickle your own fleshly desires. So there's a big disconnect from passages like this today and, and what people are actually hearing in many, many churches, unfortunately. Yes. Now, I'm just a bit mindful of the time here. Uh, so I'm just going to stop sharing this screen because I think there's a couple of things that I think we should be discussing now. I think the scriptures are very clear about persecution that it will come uh, so it's like we spoke earlier it's about preparing the body of christ for what is to come uh, we would not be responsible if we did not highlight these scriptures and prepare believers for what's to come um, i think one of the key things to take away from today that i would like everyone watching is two things that despite everything that's coming uh, and it's coming sooner than what we expect. Once again, we're not setting dates. We're not date setters. We want to be clear on that. But uh, the, the aspect of fear, I still see a lot of believers, whether it be with this virus or government persecution or whatever the case is, there's a lot of people that are carrying a lot of fear, a lot of believers. Uh, I'll hand over to you, Marco. But just before that, Baruch, well, what's your message to people watching this discussion today? looking at what's coming, how they should handle and not be afraid. What's your message to them, Brooke? Perfect love casts out all fear. If we focus upon loving Messiah, receiving that love and loving him, which is seen in commitment, 
we're going to find that he will supply our every need so that we can be faithful, that we can behave faithfully, that we can do the testimony that's pleasing to him. We don't need to fear. We need to, to be praying for faithfulness in our behavior. That's what that I would say in regard to that. Marco, over to you. What's your message to people watching this today, especially, especially those who are struggling with fear at the moment? Regarding fear, it is the, the very opposite of faith, the very opposite of faith. Jesus encourages the disciples. The Bible encourages us uh, with promises about do not be afraid. Just notice how many times Jesus tells his disciples, don't be afraid. How many times our Lord God in the Old Testament encouraged, whether it was Moses or Joshua or, or, or even the Psalms when, when uh, David speaks of fear and, and how he's to cast all uh, everything on God and not to be afraid. And, and, and whom shall I fear, David says. Um, we are to have faith and total, and, 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 and I'm going to be, I'm not trying to be technical here, but the word faith can be translated in the New Testament, faithfulness or faithful. Uh, it, it has the same meaning of faith. It's not just an aspect of believing in something intellectually, but of something of trust and something of commitment and loyalty, which is the aspect of faith and faithfulness. Uh, he who is faithful until the end, right? Uh, the, the perseverance of the saints. Uh, it's something that the book of Revelation speaks about. And, and twice we're told about this is the patience and perseverance of the saints. And both of those scriptures are tied into to the revelation of Antichrist. So there is a specific faithfulness that we need to have for believers, especially believers in the end of the age, to face these difficult things. It, it's going to be faithfulness, but it's going to take patience and it's going to take perseverance because we, we may want things to be done right away and, 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 and for God's kingdom to come on earth right away, but it may not be in our timing. It may, it may be, it, it, it is in God's timing. It may not be something that we, we expect right away or something that we say, oh, it's far off from now, or if it does happen, I hope it's quickly. Well, it's in God's hands and, and, and we trust him. The seals are in Jesus's hands. The book of Revelation is clear. He's the one that opens the seals. Mm -hmm. He's the one that opens and, clo and, 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 and closes, right? He's the one that opens and no one can shut, right? He's the one that shuts and no one can open. It's in his hands. Yeah. And when we see these things happening, we have to realize that, that there, there's so many promises in God's word, basically one for every day of the, of, the, of the year, if you wanted to put it in those terms, do not be afraid. And uh, one of the things. So apologies, uh, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost uh, connection there with Pastor Marco. Um, but we, uh, and it is very, very late in California at this time. It's uh, one o'clock in the morning. So apologies for those technical problems. But um, uh, Baruch, there's one thing that I wanted to touch on in terms of uh, the scripture in Luke 21, 28. Uh, where the Lord tells us now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. What a powerful scripture! What a powerful promise! It's so comforting. Um, can you please give us your views and commentary on that scripture for everyone watching here today? It it is a very appropriate scripture to to summarize and to leave our, our viewers with because it's a verse of encouragement when he says when you see all these things what things were he speaking about these things he's speaking to the church these things concerning wars and conflicts and famines and pestilence and persecution of believers when we see these things he says lift up your heads and this is an a, a idiom actually from the hebrew which means to be encouraged is one explanation and has a second one. It's not an either or, but it also speaks of being recognized. So get ready for God to recognize us. So when these things are all taking place, and the key word there is all taking place, we can expect God to recognize us. And how is he going to recognize us? With help, assistance, power, discernment, everything that we need to persevere until that glorious day when the heavens open up, Messiah descends with the shout of the, the, the trumpet of God, the shofar, and he's going to gather us up, call us up, and remove us prior to 
the wrath of God, not prior to tribulation, but prior to the wrath of God. So be encouraged. God's not going to forsake us. He's not going to ignore us. He's not going to forget about us. He's going to acknowledge us in the midst of these difficult times. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. And he's demonstrated his great love for us through the cross. That love is going to strengthen us. Amen. So, Pastor Marco, we, uh, we, we know we lost you there for a little while. Yeah, I, I don't know what happened. Technical it issues, so it happens. I mean, we have to realize we're in different sides of the planet here. So <laughs> you're in the U.S., Brooks in Israel, I'm here in Australia. So, but Thank praise you God, you're time. back online. So we, we yes. just wanted to finish uh, this discussion and Brooke just shared his views on Luke 21, 28, which is so important about, you know, us when these things begin to happen, just look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So very encouraging scripture. So uh, over to your closing comments, Marco, on especially the message. I want to end up with an encouraging message for viewers here today. What, Certainly. even though even though what's happening and the convergence is happening very quickly, uh, just your quick comments on a message for the believers watching. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I would say that, uh, Dr. Baruch, you're absolutely 100% right. And those were the words of, of our Messiah that was in my mind as we were kind of closing down is lift up your head, your redemption draws near. When you see all these things happening, uh, my, my encouragement for believers, um, it, it's, it's twofold. Number one, uh, as a pastor, uh, I have to tell people um, what the truth is, but I also have to tell people what the lies are. And I would be uh, remiss if I don't tell people that as we've been talking about these things, um, Christian, Dr. Baruch, uh, they're absolutely right about persecution, the increase in technology, the increase in information, the increase in persecution. It's, 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 it's something that every Christian ought to be aware and take inventory within their hearts about their love for the Lord and the time in which they live in. Uh, because it's something that it's coming very, very fast. In fact, in fact, maybe a lot more fa faster than we actually can consider. Um, and because of that, I have to remind believers that there are false things that are in the world, in the church, I should say, that would lead you away from the very things that we've been, we've been talking about. There are theologies. Uh, there are kingdom now theologies, health, prosperity, gospel, post-millennial ideas, seven mountains, as, as Christian had brought out earlier, uh, the, the uh, um, new apostolic reformation. These things are designed by the enemy, by the devil himself, to keep us from knowing the truth about God, the timing of his coming, the revelation of his truth, the revelation of his kingdom that is it's, it's, it's going to come. Paul made it clear he was looking forward until that day. And, and all New Testament writers look forward until that day. And we ought to have the same commitment and passion for that day. And the Bible puts it that day, and the day of Christ, the day he will come and glorify, and glorify us uh, as we will see him face to face. We will not be ashamed at his, at his coming. Unfortunately, these, these theologies are designed by the enemy to keep us from those truth, to, to sidetrack us, to keep us focused on this world and not where Christ is seated at, in the heavenly places. And therefore, I would, I would encourage those who watch um, you, Dr. Baruch and, and, and Christian, is to, uh, to if, if anyone caught up in these things, to leave them behind. They're there to deceive. They're there to discourage you. They're there to keep you blinded from the reality of the truth. And therefore, you will not be prepared. On the other hand, uh, it is my great joy to encourage believers uh, to continue in the faith, to not to allow these things, these difficult things, to discourage us from following Jesus. Jesus did not promise a bed of roses. He promised us a crown of thorns. He did not promise us a cushion, but a cross. And as we carry our cross and as we um, commit to him daily, therefore, we look forward to a day where we will put all these things aside and, and, and be with him. And the Bible makes it clear, thus we shall ever be with the Lord. Amen. There's something that is coming that is far greater than any believer can ever imagine. I have not seen, ears have not heard, and we have not understood in the mind of man what God has prepared for those who love him. And right. so uh, as we love Jesus, as we love God, as we love his truth and his spirit uh, in our hearts, 
we were going to be strengthened and encouraged in these difficult days by Christ himself. He has not left us or forsaken us. He will encourage us and empower us. And even if people are cut up in theologies that are deceptive, that, that there's no harm that's going to come, that we will be out before anything evil happens to us. Just like in the days of Jeremiah, uh, we are told if, if somebody's there in, the, in, in that capacity, in that thinking, to reevaluate uh, what your beliefs are based on scripture, not based on what I'm saying. Uh, my opinion does not matter, but what God's word says is absolutely vital. And so uh, make your calling and election sure and lift up your head. Your redemption draws near. He will be with us even until the end of the age. Let's get on with the work and make disciples and bring people to Jesus Christ in these days. Amen. Couldn't have said it better, brother. I, and I, I echo and concur with your uh, views. Uh, we have uh, had multiple discussion videos with Baruch where we're exposing you know, the Lord is very clear about us exposing false teachers and, and people of that nature. And, uh, you know, we have uh, been very vocal about uh, exactly what you said. Uh, we won't get into specifics again, but everything you touched on with all those false teachings, whether it be Bethel or uh, Hillsong, or, I mean, the list is a long, long list of uh, deceptive ministries out there. But, you know, let's focus on the Word of God. That's, That's right. the most important thing, uh, you know. Do not grieve or offend the Holy Spirit either, because he's the Amen. one that gives us wisdom and discernment. So, uh, Baruch, over to you for your closing comments. Just that be faithful, as we heard from Marco, be in the word and rely upon the sufficiency of Christ. That's the key. Amen. And uh, be encouraged and, uh, you know, be courageous, brothers and sisters. This is the time where we need to really press on to the Lord. You know, let, don't let go of that garment. Do not let go of him. Uh, there are some testing times. I have no doubt about that, but he will never leave us or forsake us. And, uh, you know, his word is eternal and his promises are true. So please, please, you know, reach out to him. This is the time to do it. Now, if you haven't subscribed to our, the loveisrael.org uh, YouTube channel, please do so. Please also like this video if you can as well. I uh, also encourage you and invite you to subscribe to Pastor Marco's YouTube channel, Devour Truth. Um, also, if you'd like to remain with us at the end of this uh, discussion video, there's uh, a wonderful uh, family from Alberta, Canada. Robert and Ulrich uh, Shumborski sent us a beautiful song. They gave us permission to play it. So this will be at the end of the message. I welcome you to stay for that. Uh, Pastor Marco, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been wonderful to have you. Um, you're a blessing to the body of Christ. And uh, I pray that the Lord will continue blessing you and your ministry and your family. Uh, I admire what you do. You certainly don't compromise the word of God. And that's very rare to see these days. So God bless you. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Dr. Baruch. It's uh, the, the pleasure has been mine. I, I um, really enjoyed uh, what you guys had to say and, and the ministry. Love Israel. And uh, continue to pray for Israel. I, I, I didn't make that point clear, but that is a, um, to the Jew first, Paul said, uh, God's heart for Israel has not changed. And uh, we ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're to pray for precious Jewish people. And um, we are to make that a priority uh, for believers. Uh, the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the church are bound together. I believe that with all my heart, Romans 9 through 11, just happened to read that. And uh, so uh, thank you guys so much for that, because it's, uh, you guys have hit some strings in my heart. So uh, I, I do encourage, I, I do appreciate it. You guys have encouraged me. Thank you. Thank you. And Baruch, once again, as always, thank you for your time. I certainly was blessed with your teaching today. Um, I thank you. And uh, I certainly look forward to our next video discussion, God willing, very, very soon. So brothers and sisters, to all of you watching, I hope you've been blessed. I thank you for, you for joining us. Please share this video, this discussion, if you like it. And uh, we pray that uh, you will be blessed. And from Israel, from California, USA, and from Sydney, Australia, shalom and be blessed. Lord, we drove those nails into the tree. Your hands of us.
some purity. With one word, you could have chose to live. There you stay, so Father would forgive. Kiss the sun. Kiss the sun.